everyone, welcome to our presentation today. My name is Phoebe Acevedo. I'm the curator here at the Guild Museum of Arcadia Heritage. And today joining me is Brittany Alberto, who's our museum education coordinator. Uh, this program is brought to you by the Arcadia Senior Services in partnership with the Guild Museum of Arcadia Heritage. So uh, once again, this is part of our Baldwin series, which we'll be having uh, throughout the fall months, which is going to be great. So this is our first one. We're going to be talking about Elias Jackson's Lucky Baldwin. And the next one's going to be in October, where we'll be talking about Anita Baldwin, Lucky Baldwin's daughter. And last but not least, in November 5th, we will be talking about Clara Baldwin's stalker. So if you enjoy our program today, this will be recorded and you can share it with anyone who wasn't able to attend today. Um, and another thing I did want to note, um, some uh, little updates for you all um, that Rec Center wanted to share with you all is that next Friday, September 17th, the Senior Services Division will be hosting a drive-through Western Ho Down Lunch. This event is $10 and pickup times begin at 10.30 a.m. Um, please call the Community Center uh, front desk if you have any questions about that. And the other note that we have here is that on Thursday, September 3rd, there will be another virtual presentation in partnership with the Methodist Hospital. This discussion will be hosted by cardiologist and electrophysicist uh, Susie Liu, MD, who will discuss irregular heartbeat, um, atrial fibrillation, and heart health. So if you're interested in that, feel free to register as well through the community center. So today, as I mentioned, we are going to be having um, Brittany Alberto uh, presenting on Elias Jackson, Lucky Baldwin. So if you have any questions, we do ask that you wait till the end of the presentation. And um, if you have any questions as well, feel free to sign on the chat and I will answer any questions you guys have as you present. So take it away, Brittany. Hi, can everybody hear me well? Perfect, okay, I'm going to share my screen. So give me one minute, everybody. Can everybody see the presentation well? Excellent, all righty, everybody. So today we're gonna to be talking about Elias Jackson Baldwin, who's kind of known um, very well uh, in this area as Lucky Baldwin. He had quite a legacy in the state of California not just in Arcadia, but other places as well. And we're going to explore that legacy. And as Stevie mentioned, this program is presented in conjunction by the Guild Museum of Arcadia Heritage and the Arcadia Senior Services Department. Um, we are the staff here at the Guild Museum and we are kind of like this really cool place for research. Um, and we're really excited to have you here today. Today we're going to be talking about Elias Jackson Baldwin and if you've ever been down on Baldwin Avenue, you've been to Lucky Baldwin's Pub, you've been to Baldwin Park, all these names are named after um, Lucky Baldwin. He's also the person responsible for bringing horse racing and peacocks to Arcadia. He was the founder of the city of Arcadia and the city's first mayor. If you've ever been to the um, Los Angeles County Arboretum and Botanic Garden. He is also responsible for the Queen Anne's Cottage and several of the other historic structures that are there. So he has kind of like this really um, storied legacy, which we really hope to explore in the next hour. And as you can see, we have this um, quote from an interview from the New York Times where they said that Mr. Baldwin's fortune did not come to him by some sudden streak of luck, as his name would indicate, but it was accumulated gradually. Elias Jackson Baldwin was actually named in part for Andrew Jackson, who was actually born the same year that he was, or that be, who became president the same year that he was born, and that would be 1828. Um, and he was also partially named for his paternal grandfather, Elias Baldwin. Um, he was born April 3rd, 1828 in Butler County, Ohio um, to William Alexander Crooks Baldwin and Elizabeth Miller Baldwin. And as you can see, I know it's a little hard to read, but we actually do have um, their record of marriage from Ohio. Um, and you can see in the red box, um, married on the 22nd day of April um, by John Ramey Esquire, a justice of the peace, um, was William Baldwin to Elizabeth Miller. So those were Elias Jackson Baldwin's parents. Um, and 
Uh, Elias was actually one of three born to Alexander and Elizabeth that would actually live to adulthood, um, including Elias's older brother, George Washington, who was also obviously named for a president, and um, Evelyn, who was um, Lucky Baldwin's younger sister. The family was always um, in search for um, new opportunities and available land, so they really moved around the Ohio, Indiana area um, all throughout um, Elias's um, childhood. And um, this was also a really big place for opportunities. Um, you have to think that in the early 19th century, Ohio and Indiana, they were considered to be very far out west. Um, of course, California was not yet a state, um, and this was kind of the most west that a lot of people had been at the time um, in terms of the United States. Um, and Lucky Baldwin, he got a lot of his opportunities um, out in places like Ohio and Indiana. And then, of course, um, when he was living in Indiana, he actually met a neighboring girl, Sarah Ann Unruh. And he really did fall in love with her um, very quickly. Um, she was 16 and he was 18. Um, and she was described by her contemporaries as a pretty girl who could cook very well. Um, this is one of the very few photos of Sarah Ann um, that we do have. And um, Elias, he really did have a desire to marry her. And in this very... Um, lucky Baldwin fashion that we'll see later in his character. Um, he wanted to prove that he could support her and um, he wanted to show that he could uh, care for her. And by doing so, he actually went out to a horse race and he bet on some horses and he actually won $200 in a horse race in South Bend, Indiana. And by winning that $200, that was his sign that he could financially support a wife. So. Um, when uh, Sarah Ann was 16, he packed her up in a wagon and they actually went across the border to Bertrand, uh, Michigan, and they actually got married. Um, and this was in 1846. The couple, they moved to Valparaiso, Indiana, and they actually had their first child, Clara, who was born on May 14th, 1847. And we're gonna be talking about Clara in a later program, so stay tuned for that one um, as well. Um, but the small family, they also were moving around a lot. You know, they were also looking for opportunities. So they went to Racine, Wisconsin, which was also considered to be very far out west. And it was in Wisconsin where Elias actually established his very first hotel. He's known for having hotels here in California, but Wisconsin is actually where he got his first start um, in the hotel business. Um, and he named his first hotel the Racine House. And unfortunately, it does not exist um, anymore. Um, but it was actually in his hotel that Lucky Baldwin heard a lot of stories of California. And 1847, um, California was not yet a state, um, but there were a lot of stories of maybe something going on there, um, ec economic opportunities um, to be had out there. And then, of course, you know, uh, California would enter the Union. And in fact, the anniversary of California entering the Union was just a few days ago. And um, Elias, he was interested in these stories, but he was cautious. He wasn't somebody who would jump into things um, very quickly. So he sat on these stories for about uh, three years. And then in 1853, Elias and the small family, they actually did make the decision to move out to California. Of course, California was barely a state at that time. Um, and uh, but it was the stories of the gold that really drew people to California. And 1853 was one of the biggest years, actually, for people traveling overland um, from the east to California. And while other people were thinking about gold, Lucky Baldwin actually was more thinking of 
what he could sell to people for a great profit. So he loaded up、um, one wagon with tea and tobacco and brandy entirely for trading purposes.、Um, and another wagon held like furniture, personal items, Sarah Ann、um, and Clara,、um, who at the time was six. And in the group that went to California was also、um, an 18 year old girl named. Rachel Wormer, daughter of Horace Wormer, who would actually purchase the Racine Hotel、um, from Lucky.、Um, they also had、uh, W.F. McHenry, a grocer, Dr. J.L. Page, a physician who had lived in Lucky Baldwin's Racine Hotel, Reuben M. Norton, the first mayor of Racine, and Justice Cartwright、uh, and Thomas B. Wright, who were、uh, local blacksmiths. So, their group slowly made their way along、um, the California Trail,、um, which can be seen in red on this map. There were several trails to go to California, but、um, the California Trail was one of the most popular and was the one that、um, Elias and his group took. And they stopped in many places like Fort Laramie, Wyoming, and Salt Lake City, which was in the Utah Territory. Utah had not yet become a state. And it took about five months of traveling. And then the group finally arrived in Placerville, California, which was then known as Hangtown. And according to legend, Lucky Baldwin actually stumbled across the border from、um, Nevada, what is now Nevada, which used to be the Utah Territory,、um, to California barefoot because supposedly he had given his shoes to another girl he had met on the trail. And of course, maybe today we know、um, Elias Jackson Baldwin as、um, being a really affectionate with women.、Um, so maybe he got his start here, but who knows? And、uh, the Baldwins they settled in San Francisco, which then was、um, a really big city. It was the largest city at, out west at the time. And Baldwin actually became involved in flipping hotels. So he would buy hotels really cheaply and he would、um, improve them in several ways. And then he would sell them back to profit. He did notice that a lot of people owned hotels in San Francisco, but they were very inexperienced in doing so. And so he, he did have some knowledge about、um, how to run a very sex, su successful、um, luxury hotel.、Um, and so this is kind of one of the first ways that he made money while he was、um, in California. And also at the same time, he kind of he became involved in the brick business,、um, which was another、um, economic venture that he took. Um, one of his companions, if you remember, on his overland trail was Rachel Wormer, the daughter of Horace Wormer. And Baldwin was entrusted by Horace to deliver Rachel to her brother, who was living in San Francisco and owned a brick business. And、um, he, uh, lucky he did drop her off. And a few years later, he was actually interested in、um, checking up on the Wormer family and their brick business. And、um, actually, in visiting the Wormers, he decided that day that brick making was a really good venture, a very good economic venture.、Um, we also have to think that San Francisco was really developing at this time, and there was a lot of、um, real estate purchases, a lot of building. So he thought that bricks would、um, be an excellent way to make money. And so he actually did learn the secrets of brick making from the Wormer family. But within two months after learning all the secrets, he actually dissolved his relationship with the Wormer family and started his own brick making business.、Um, he didn't really like to go into economic ventures、um, as a partner, he liked to do them on his own、um, so that he could、uh, take the share of all of the profits. And that's also part of his character. This is also where we see、um, Lucky Baldwin divorce Sarah Ann.、Um, they divorced in 1854 following、um, two children unfortunately dying in infancy.、Um, but you know, Elias Jackson Baldwin, he took everything in stride. He devoted himself to his、um, capitalistic ventures. And Sarah Ann, for her part, she ended up being completely fine and she、um, also remarried 
again to somebody else. Also in 1875, Baldwin opened his really grand Baldwin Hotel and Theater, and we can actually see that here um, on the right. It was known as a gathering place for the city's elite, and the opening performance of the theater was Richard III um, featuring James O'Neill, who is pictured um, here to the left. Mm -hmm. Lucky Baldwin also knew that there was money to be made in purchasing shares, especially in the mining business. And if we think about California, um, we think about gold, um, we think about silver. His first uh, purchase was in Grass Valley, California, located adjacent to um, what is now Tahoe National Forest. Um, he would purchase and trade fractional interests in mining businesses before the businesses actually started any mining. So it was when the mine or the mining companies, they said, we intend to mine, um, please help us um, build capital. And so um, he would, um, he would do that. And he would never invest in a mine until he actually went into the mines himself. So that's a really interesting part about him. He wanted to make sure that all of his capitalistic ventures were very sound. Um, so that's where we have this quote to the left. Um, he says, that's the way that I made my money for I never had any great stroke of luck like other men. I worked hard and examined the mines that I bought. I crawled through the tunnels and went down shafts and labored for years. And um, this is where Baldwin really becomes um, known for his involvement in the Comstock load, which was a really thick vein of silver ore surrounding Virginia City, um, which at the time was in the Utah Territory. And he really did invest um, in the Comstock load. And this is where he made a lot of his money, leading to his um, nickname, Lucky Baldwin. Um, he also got involved in wildcat investing, which was commercial ventures that were highly, uh, that could be highly profitable or um, lead to great loss. Um, and a lot of people really hesitant in um, this type of investing. Um, and it really brought the mining stock business to ill repute, but Lucky Baldwin, he actually thought that it was a very good venture. And he would actually, um, he would actually take part in these um, wildcat investments. Um, in 1864, Baldwin was confident that mines were, would produce, so he heavily invested in the Savage, Kolar Potosi, and Yellow Jacket mines. And he was correct in his assumption that the mines would be fruitful. And in 1867, the Kolar Potosi was producing hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of silver, and the Savage and Yellow Jacket mines were producing millions of dollars. So because of his very early investments, he did take large shares of the, that money. And it is also well known that Elias Jackson Baldwin did not like his nickname, uh, Lucky. He, when he was asked about it, he would argue that he worked just as hard as anyone else to get his money. Um, so he really um, downplayed it, but the newspapers, they didn't, they thought that the name Lucky was amazing. Stories of Lucky Baldwin would always appear in newspapers and they had really high um, readership because it was kind of like this rags to riches story. You know, young man from Ohio, he goes to California and makes a fortune. And after reaping the benefits of his early investing, Baldwin was invited on a trip to India by a group of British sport hunters. And before he left, he locked his remaining Ophir, Crown Point, and Hale and Norcross shares in a safe and left instructions with his broker to sell his shares if they happened to reach $800 a share, which is the price that he had originally bought them at. But as luck would have it, he mistakenly took the key to his safe with him to India, um, where he hunted um, tigers and then when he became tired of hunting tigers, he decided to travel to Japan, where he became engaged with a group of Jap Japanese acrobats, which he brought back to the U.S. for a vaudeville tour. And he actually took them um, across the U.S. Um, from New York to San Francisco. 
And it was when he returned to San Francisco, he realized his mistake in taking the key to his safe with him to India. Um, and when he had originally intended to sell the shares um, at $800, when he returned, the shares were valued at $12,000. So um, Elias Jackson Baldwin, who was already a millionaire, gained another $5 million just because of this really small mistake. And thus, the name Lucky Baldwin was born. And um, here you could see a caricature of him um, from when he was hunting tigers in India. Although I don't really think it's that great of a depiction. He was not quite so portly and um, he had different um, facial hair. But in any case, that's kind of what he became known as, this lucky man who went tiger hunting and came back um, to more millions of dollars. And so um, after this, we, we come to the 1870s and, you know, he's very, very busy. Um, he married, then divorced, a woman named Mary Cochran, a woman he met in San Francisco and in divorcing her um, was forced to give a one million dollar settlement and unfortunately um, there's not much record of Mary Cochran but all the same she was acknowledged as his um, second wife. Um, his daughter Clara was already a grown woman at this time and she married a man named Bud Doble who was already famous for being a horse racer. And in 1875, he heard of um, possible mines that could be invested in in Southern California. And he decided to board a ship and um, he took that ship down the California coast um, into what is now known as Santa Monica. And he stayed in a place known as the Pico House, which was then known as the finest hotel in Southern California. You can still visit the Pico House um, today. Um, I believe it is a museum. And he would like to ride out into the neighboring areas. And one day he came out to the San Gabriel Valley and he exclaimed when he got to the San Gabriel Valley, by God, this is paradise and he really um, was interested in purchasing um, the land he came upon Rancho Santa Anita and he determined that you know the ground was very fertile there was open fields there was a lot of um, beautiful greenery and he approached Harris Newmark who was the then owner of Rancho Santa Anita um, Harris Newmark was a grocer and um, Harris was actually not very interested in making the sale. He was interested in keeping Rancho Santa Anita for himself. And, but Lucky Baldwin, he kind of like pressed on Harris Newmark and pressured him. And um, Harris eventually conceded and um, sold the rancho for $225,000. And um, Lucky actually very also very famously, he paid much of the cash um, up front, he was said to carry around a little tin box with him. And in that box, he actually would keep thousands of dollars um, for himself. So he paid um, for the rancho um, in cash and he immediately got to work. He established a dairy. So he brought much cattle um, to the area. He also brought in pigs and planted many um, fruit orchards on his new tract of land. And of course, we care about Rancho Santa Anita because that was the land that today is known as the city of Arcadia and why we are talking about Lucky Baldwin um, today. But um, Lucky, he would go kind of back and forth from Southern California um, to Northern California in San Francisco, especially because that was where his love lived. In 1875, Baldwin had met Virginia Dexter in um, Virginia City, and he just became so enamored with her, fixated with her. Um, 
1875, we also have to remember, was the same year that Baldwin had divorced his second wife, Mary Cochran. And it is widely speculated that his divorce with Mary Cochran was um, done at the urging of his then mistress, Jenny Dexter, who we can see here. Um, she was also, uh, much like Sarah and Unruh, known to be um, very beautiful, dark eyed, um, very very gorgeous um, for her day and she was also known as the love of his life if later in his life when lucky was asked who um, he had truly loved um, he did say that he loved jenny dexter she was described as a big eyed tiny footed woman interestingly enough she was nine years younger than lucky's first daughter clara so he's really interested in this very much younger woman. And we have to remember that Clara, by this time, she's already married to Bud Doble. Um, but they, um, Jenny Dexter and Lucky Baldwin, they did get married. And in 1876, Jenny and Elias, they had their first daughter, Anita, um, who, which was Baldwin's second child, who we, we will also be speaking about in a later program. Um, Anita, Baldwin was actually younger than Lucky Baldwin's first granddaughter, Rosebud Doble. Um, and Anita was named for Lucky's um, Southern California property, Rancho Santa Anita. Um, <clears throat> and um, Lucky Baldwin and Jenny and Anita, they lived in the Baldwin Hotel, but unfortunately on November 16th, 1881, Jenny Dexter Baldwin would die of tuberculosis at the age of 23 in the Baldwin Hotel. Um, Elias Jackson Baldwin, he was very heartbroken. You know, this had been the love of his life and they had only been married for um, very few years. Um, and it was said that for the rest of his life, he would keep a pair of her shoes and a pair of her gloves in a cabinet in his home. And so um, with all this sadness, you know, Lucky Baldwin, he started to devote more of his time to his Southern California property. Also in the 1880s, he um, this is where he becomes very well known for his many affairs with women. In 1883, for example, he was shot uh, on Market Street in San Francisco by his own niece, Frances Baldwin, who was also known as Verona Baldwin, um, who claimed that he had sexually assaulted her at his Santa Anita ranch. Another woman, Lenny McCormack, accused Baldwin of indiscreet behavior towards her, although um, not very many records of what this indiscreet behavior um, has survived. In 1883, uh, the same year that he got shot by Verona Baldwin, he actually married Lily Bennett, a young girl who is said to have a striking, striking resemblance to Jenny Dexter. And let's remember that Jenny Dexter was supposedly the love of his life. Um, their marriage um, made headlines because, you know, by then he's an older man and Lily Bennett, she had only been um, a teenager at this time. Um, but it also made headlines because it was announced um, this uh, the next year that he was getting sued by a woman named Louise Perkins for breach of promise of marriage. Apparently, um, Baldwin had taken Louise Perkins to the Palace Hotel in San Francisco and promised to marry her. Um, and she found out that Lucky Baldwin was not going to marry her when she read that he had already married Lily Bennett in the newspaper. Louise Perkins um, sued Lucky Baldwin for $500,000 and was actually granted $75,000 um, by a judge. And then in 1886, Verona Baldwin, she actually shows up again, demanding that Lucky Baldwin support her child that he had supposedly fathered. Um, but before paternity could be confirmed, she actually um, skipped town and moved to the Washington Territory. Um, she was later admitted to an insane asylum in the Napa Valley, so um, it was never clear if that child she had was actually Lucky Baldwin's child. So 
He be became very uh, well known and all of the sordid details, of course, were published um, in papers across the country, but probably none was as um, well published as his affair with Lillian Ashley. This was um, the most famous of his affairs. Um, in 1896, he was sued by Lillian Ashley for um, seduction, and she claimed that he fathered her daughter Beatrice, um, and she would subsequently name him as the father of Beatrice on any um, legal documents. Um, but Lucky refused to recognize Beatrice as his daughter, and um, so they go to court um, in San Francisco, and on July 2nd, 1896, when Lucky is being um, cross-examined, Emma Ashley, the sister of Lillian Ashley, pulled a pistol from her handbag and actually shot at Lucky Baldwin, grazing him in the head. And when um, Emma Ashley had been taken to the local San Francisco City Prison, she actually said, she actually admitted, I did it. I shot him because he ruined my poor sister and ruined all of us. I sat in the courtroom and heard his witnesses from the East accuse her, her being Lillian Ashley, of gross immorality. And that dear little baby, Baldwin's own child that looks just like him is at home. And um, she had this really... Um, very, very lengthy interview that was published um, in the paper. And um, a lot of people were really interested because, of course, you know, um, a man getting sued for seduction and being shot in the actual courtroom um, was perfect headliner news. Um, and although she was acting um, in the interests of her sister, um, Ellie, Emma Ashley actually doomed Lillian and the judge actually threw out the case. So Beatrice was never recognized as one of Baldwin's children, although later she would call herself um, Beatrice Baldwin. So it was very unfortunate. Um, and much like the daughter or the child of Verona Baldwin, it was another child whose paternity um, could never be substantiated, but for very different reasons. Um, and here we have a, a picture depicting um, Emma Ashley um, trying to shoot at Lucky Baldwin. And you could see him, he's trying to um, shield himself with his arm. He's kind of behind that puff of smoke. And that's where she um, grazed the side of his head. And um, again, people love to bring him back to his nickname, Lucky, saying that not only was he lucky in making all of his millions of dollars, he was very lucky um, for escaping um, death. And this was the second time in a decade that um, Lucky Baldwin was shot by a woman for supposedly um, having a relationship with her. So very interesting um, decade for Lucky Baldwin. Um, but Lucky Baldwin, he tries to spend as much of his time, you know, back at his um, Rancho Santa Anita. He grew many different kinds of fruits and vegetables, inclu including um, grapes for wine and apricot for apricots for brandies. And as you can see to the left, we actually have a bottle of his apricot brandy cordial that has never been opened. This is actually on display here at the Guild Museum. So if you would like to see it, you could feel free to visit us during our open hours. And that's my little um, pitch um, to visit the Guild Museum. But from 1885 to 1886, Baldwin um, goes to work creating his Baldwin's Belvedere, which is also known as the Queen Anne's Cottage. The Queen Anne's Cottage um, can be seen to this day on the grounds of the Los Angeles County Arboretum and Botanic Garden. It was likely a honeymoon gift for his fourth wife, Lily Bennett, um, but unfortunately, the marriage um, would not last. I wouldn't be surprised if it was his other relationships with women that kind of drew her away. They um, split in December of the same year that they got married. They got had they had gotten married in May, um, but they actually never officially divorced. They were just separated for very many years. Um, 
And in the wake of the divorce,、um, Lucky decided to devote the cottage to his third wife, Jenny Dexter. Again, the love of his life. He also brought his racehorses down, and after building the Queen Anne's cottage, he would create the coach barn, which was done in the same、um, architectural Queen Anne's style. The coach barn can also be seen on the grounds of the LA County Arboretum,、um, and he. Wanted to transform the rancho into a city, and he wanted it to be the sportiest place in history. And that is a direct quote. He wanted it to be the sportiest. The only people he really had to fight was the anti-saloon league, which feel which feared that、um, the area would turn to like debauchery and gambling. And、um, I mean, to their credit, many gamblers did go to、um, Rancho Santa Anita、um, after hearing all of the bets that could be made there.、Um, in 1903, Baldwin filed a petition for the incorporation of his property into a municipality. And、um, while his fledgling city actually did lack the population necessary to establish a city, he actually、um, interestingly resorted to bringing immigrants who were landing in San Pedro to Arcadia to Rancho Santa Anita via the Pacific Electric Railway, and he would actually proclaim them citizens on the spot.、Um, and Because of his efforts, you know, he actually did get the population necessary to create a city. And a few months later,、um, in 1903, the State Board of Supervis Supervisors did approve his application for Rancho Santa Anita to become a city, and that city, of course, would be known as Arcadia. And、um, the New York Times. In 1908, proclaimed that the area was on track to become a Western Monte Carlo, and、um, I do have that、um, newspaper article to the right. And、um, they believed that、um, his Western Monte Carlo would make the European resort of Monte Carlo turn green with envy because of all of the bedding and、um, amazing things that could be happened here.、Um, We could also think that at this time it was considered to be very much the Wild West.、Um, there was no police force、um, in this area, so it was a lot of debauchery. They're probably correct in saying that.、Um, and Lucky Baldwin also had the desire to build a racetrack, which was、um, meant to be the heart of the city of Arcadia. And according to the LA Times, Lucky Baldwin did desire、um, the entire city to be done in a three-mile radius around the track, with the track in the center. And speaking of that track,、um, uh, Baldwin did decide to open up a track, and the park actually did open in 1907. For 103 days of racing,、um, he spared no expense, and it was called the most modern of all the race tracks in the far west. And although、um, today you can see the Santa Anita race track in the city of Arcadia, that is actually not the same one as Lucky Baldwin's race track. The original Baldwin's race track、um, was actually on. The city block where this museum is, as well as the Arcadia County Park,、um, it's a very big space. But unfortunately, the structure is no longer there. Baldwin also had the foresight to expect that a newfangled invention, the automobile, actually had the power to bring many people to Arcadia. So he did ensure that there would be paved roads、um, leading to the racetrack. And on the last day of the first season of horse racing, Baldwin came out to the racetrack, and he proclaimed, "I desire no other monument. This is the greatest thing I have ever done, and I am satisfied." And Baldwin's horses, of course, would carry his colors, which consisted of a maroon Maltese cross on a black background. And Baldwin actually made this area famous、um, by winning、uh, many classic American horse races and inviting many horse racers to come to this area. But、um, very sadly, as the track had been created in 1907,、um, Lucky Baldwin would pass away in 1909. 
um, the same year actually that horse racing became illegal in the state of California. And um, in a few years, the track fell into disrepair and burned to the ground in 1912. So that is why the structure is no longer standing. But very thankfully, a new Santa Anita racetrack was built in 1934. Um, so we do still have horse racing in this area, um, but much of the thanks does go to Lucky Baldwin. In addition to establishing the city of Arcadia and serving as the city's first mayor and erecting Arcadia's first racetrack, serving as a vaudeville producer, he was also responsible for bringing peacocks to um, the area. You may have seen peacocks wandering, wandering around um, Arcadia and some of our neighboring cities. Um, he was the one who brought them here. He fell in love with them when he was in India and decided to have many roam around his property, which in his day was a very great sign of wealth. He was not the only person to bring peacocks to um, Southern California, um, but he was responsible for bringing them to Arcadia. He also in his life served as the president of the Pacific Savings Bank and created the Talak region's premier resort hotel. Um, he also was inv involved in um, logging, more mining, and um, much more. There's so much that could be said about Lucky Baldwin. And his biographer, C.B. Glassock, did claim him to be the embodiment of the unmoral frontier. And that is to say that he did come to California, which is considered the frontier. Um, and while many people were known for mining and striking it rich, he was really known for coming to California and having this very flamboyant lifestyle with many different kinds of women and also um, making his money. Sometimes he could be reckless. He was typically a cautious um, kind of person, but um, we wouldn't really call him lucky if he was cautious all of the time. And there is so much that could be said about Lucky Baldwin, definitely much more than can be said um, in a single hour. But to end, I would like to quote Baldwin himself. And he said, all of the things I have told you is only a very vague outline of the real facts. A detailed history of these things would exceed the tale of Aladdin's lamp and people would not believe what they read for it would be like a dream. And unfortunately, this brings us to the end of the program. If any of you has any questions, you um, can definitely unmute yourself or put them in the chat and I would love to answer them. Thank you very much. It was really great to be a part of the Arcadia Senior Services um, Baldwin series. Yay, I guess that means that there's no question. Maybe I said everything that there could have been said about Lucky Baldwin. Once again, like Brittany said, thank you so much everyone for attending today's uh, presentation. Thank you, Brittany, for uh, giving such a, uh, a lot of information and you're such a wealth of knowledge now about Lucky Baldwin. Um, and so this video um, or this uh, presentation today has been recorded. So we will be having this up on the museum's YouTube channel. And we'll also make sure to put that YouTube channel on our museum's website. So if you are interested or if you want to share this uh, really great presentation with anybody, you all are more than welcome to do so. But yeah, we, um, you have a question, Brittany. Oh, good question. So where did Lucky Baldwin live? He lived kind of all over the place. Um, if we're talking about California, he lived for several years um, in his Baldwin Hotel. Um, I unfortunately didn't get to it in his um, in this presentation but he had his own apartment in the hotel. And unfortunately, when the hotel burned to the ground, um, he actually almost did perish because he was sleeping in his apartment and somebody actually had to break down the door. Um, he 
when when you're talking about Rancho Santa Anita, he actually did not live in the Queen Anne's cottage. Many people think that he did live there. Um, of course, it's called Bald, Baldwin's Belvedere, and some people think that that means that he lived there. But he actually lived in an adobe house that was on his property. Um, today, that is known as the Hugo Reed Baldwin Adobe. So Hugo Reed um, was a previous, a much previous owner of Rancho Santa Anita, and he erected the adobe. Um, but he left it there and it was living or it was existing there for many, many years. And so Baldwin, he actually added a wing to it. And I think he put it in a porch and he lived there when he was on his Rancho Santa Anita property. That's a very good question. Thank you. And if any of you has any other questions, you can always feel free to stop by the museum um, and we would be happy to answer any other questions about Lucky Baldwin that you may have. Okay, well, thank you so much, Brittany, once again. Thank you to Senior Services. I know Chris is on the um, presentation with us today. So um, we hope that you continue to enjoy the Baldwin series. The next one will be on October 8th at 10 a.m. once again, and that one will be on Anita Baldwin. Alrighty, thank you, everybody. All right, have a great day.